Hi everyone, this is a differentiable perceptual audio metric learned from just noticeable differences. I am Pranay Manocha, presenting on behalf of folks at Princeton and Adobe Research. So let's get started. So let's do a listening test together. Consider this reference audio clip. Securely in the recesses of the house after the fa Now which audio sounds most similar to it? Audio 1? Securely in the recesses of the house after the fa Or audio 2? Securely in the recesses of the house after the fact. So you probably thought audio one, and indeed humans we tested also agreed. However, all conventional metrics like L1, L2, PESC, and VSQL actually chose audio two. So hereby we see that these metrics don't correlate well with human perceptual judgments. So the question is, can we build a perceptual metric which reliably agrees more often with humans? So the task of audio similarity is to compare different audio signals, and it's an ext extremely important task for one. Researchers rely on similarity metrics to evaluate and compare algorithms, and it's used to guide the improvement of algorithms. And for two, these similarity metrics, if differentiable, can be directly optimized for as a loss function in deep learning, which is important for designing good algorithms. As we saw, conventional metrics like L1, L2 are just numerical differences that don't really reflect human perception of similarity. Very early perceptual models like PESC and VSQL were inspired by the way human ear processes signals, especially in the middle ear. But these approaches have their own limitations. For one, they are not robust to audio samples that are close and have very subtle differences, like in the example that we just heard. And two, they are non-differentiable. So to address the non-differentiability aspect, researchers looked at a differentiable PESC like the two works of QualityNet and DeepLoss. These metrics were approximations of PESC and so are not robust to unseen audio and unseen audio perturbations. Researchers have also explored GANs as a similarity metric, like the work of metric GAN by Fu et al. in 2018. These approaches are too task specific and may not be easily optimizable always. Finally, we look at deep feature losses from a pre-trained network have been explored extensively as in the work of style transfer by the work of Kedis et al. These features were shown to be correlated to human judgment by the work of Zhang et al. in 2018. Similarly, in the audio community, we have looked at the audio deep features by Jarbain et al. But the basic drawback here is that we are using repurposed weights from a different task, and we hope that these weights would generalize to perceptual similarity. But instead, can we actually do better by directly using perceptual data? So in order to create a differentiable metric that aligns well with human Perception, we first create a data set of human perceptual judgments, including by including various types of noises and perturbations. And then we train a model on this data set, which further becomes our metric. We evaluate our metric with existing subjective tests and show improvements, as well as show an application of a metric as a loss function in speech enhancement and show significant gains. So here is how we create the data set. We take various perturbations. So audio perturbations are just some noise which is added to a clean audio. And let's listen to a few examples. So let's listen, first listen to a clean audio first. I had to cling tight to the backstay. Let's now listen to one example of additive noise like white noise. I had to cling tight to the backstay. We can now listen to an example of reverberation. I had to cling tight to the backstay. We can now actually listen to one example of compression like MP3 compression. I had to cling tight to the backstay. Equalization noise. I had to cling tight to the backstay. And a few examples of miscellaneous noises. For example, let's listen to this pop sound. I had to cling tight to the backstay. And finally, let's look at a combined perturbation where we combine a variety of these perturbations we looked at. So in this example that you'll hear, we combined pops, reverberation, and white noise. I had to cling tight to the backstay. So, now that we have the perturbation system set up, how do we actually collect samples from this space? We follow the strategy of just noticeable difference, JND, where we show a reference and a disordered signal and ask a very simple question. Are these two recordings exactly identical or different? This allows us to study human perception near JND, which is an important task in various audio problems. For example, in cases where we would like to enhance the audio quality as perceived by a human. There are other ways of getting judgment for example, considering triplets, so given a reference and two noisy samples, we want to ask which one sounds closer to the reference. This has an obvious limitation, as in if these two noisy examples, A and B, they, if they differ in orthogonal ways, then a person will consciously decide which one they prefer, thereby inducing user bias. 
So to account for this bias, a triplet study would require far more data points than the JND study to cover a variety of perturbations. Our efficient sampling strategy, which we'll just describe in a moment, also helps reduce the number of samples we collect. So to efficiently sample pairs from this space, let's see an example in action. So just for illustration purpose, we define a very simple perturbation space consisting of just two perturbations, white noise and reverb. Our actual space consists of a lot more dimensions. So in this case, the origin uh, depicts the clean version or the non-noisy version of the reference. So in this, we choose any clean audio recording. Let's have a listen to one such reference. I had to cling tight to the backstay. So now we choose any point P1 randomly in this perturbation space. We can get to point P1 from the reference by adding this much amount of noise and this much amount of reverb to our clean audio. And we correspondingly create uh, the audio at point P1, which is a function which takes in the clean audio and the perturbation strength at point P1. So here is what the audio at point P1 would sound like. I had to cling tight to the backstay. So we want to estimate the JND of a listener given this point P1. It might look something like the curve shown in red. Each detection has a specific JND due to interaction between different perturbations, like what we show here. And we choose one such random direction and ask what's the best way to estimate this for a given direction and a reference point P1. So we choose a point P2, which is about 50 decibels away, and divide the axis in between into equal bins, and then finally end up checking each and every bin. It's highly sample inefficient. So we think of ways in which we can improve this metric. So here I'm about to describe our active learning sampling strategy to estimate the JND efficiently. We choose a point P2, which is about 50 decibels away. Let's listen to how P2 would sound like. Uh, so P2 here has high levels of both noise and reverb than P1. So let's listen to an example. I had to cling tight to the backstage. So how do we estimate the point P3? We assume that human answers follow a Gaussian distribution with a mean at the JND point and some variance that represents human error. And the idea is to maximize the likelihood of fitting all the results of all past N answers that a listener has given and to find the best value of mu that fits all the observations. And the value of P3 would then be just equal to the value of mu. And as we keep on getting more points, our model becomes more accurate in predicting JND. Let's also listen to how P4 would sound like. I had to cling tight to the backstay. So P4 and P1 sound identical to us, making point P4 just below our JND threshold. And we get subsequently more points by our same sampling strategy. And after a few fixed iterations, our model predicts the JND. So the advantages of this approach is that uh, this is very sample efficient in terms of logarithmic. And this operation can actually be done in real time. So now that we have sampled the space efficiently, how do we actually get pair judgments? We crowdsource this perceptual dataset using Amazon Mechanical Turk. Given that we ask a very simple and unambiguous question, allows us to deploy this in a very uncontrolled setting as in Amazon Mechanical Turk. Using this, we are able to collect a data set consisting of about 55,000 pairs of human perceptual judgment. So now that we have collected the data set, we can talk about training our metric. We follow the simple architecture where we have two audio inputs, which are passed into a loss network. We take the difference of the two feature stacks across layers respectively, and then averaged out to get one distance value that quantifies how different these two recordings are. We take four variations of the same model, and this first variation is the pre, which uh, is short for pre-trained. This model is trained on two audio classification tasks and not in any way uh, on our perceptual dataset. Next, we add certain linear weights to the model. These weights can be considered a linear calibration of an off-the-shelf network. So this is the LIN or the linear weights trained model as only the linear weights are trained on the perceptual dataset. Next, we look at a fine-tuned model where we pre-train the weights first on audio classification tasks as in pre, but then also fine-tune the last n layers and the linear weights on perceptual data. This model is called FIN, which is short for fine-tune. And lastly, let's look at a scratch model where we train everything from scratch on perceptual data. This includes the loss network and the linear weights. So after we train our metric, we want to evaluate our metric with human subjective ratings, MOS, which, which stands for mean opinion scores. We want to do this across a large data set of audio similarity problems. So we look at three data sets. The first one is VOCO, uh, which is a word insertion and synthesis data set. 
Next, we look at F15Net, which is a deep learning based P synthesis dataset. So, in both these datasets, there is a big perceptual difference between these different algorithms. And in both these datasets, uh, we have pairs of signals that are not time aligned. The third task is that of bandwidth expansion, which is the task of expanding the frequency range of the signal. So we measure performance using correlation analysis, especially Pearson and Spearman's correlation between the distance from our metric and the MOS score. As an extension, we also check for 2AFC accuracy, where 2AFC stands for two alternative force choice test, in which we play a reference and two noisy clips and ask which one is closer to the reference. This metric checks for ordering, for example, in cases uh, where A is closer to C than B is to C, whereas the MOS test checks for both scale and ordering, except for example, how much is A closer to C. So we take already existing datasets and convert them into a triplet format, and we finally measure accuracy using percentage accuracy as a metric. So let's now look at how our metrics compare with conventional metrics. We'll also compare the metrics with two self-supervised train models, which are trained on large-scale audio datasets, like BGGish and OpenL3, then the higher the numbers, the better the correlation. So let's uh, go through each observation one by one in detail. So the first observation that we have is that neural network based metrics are more robust to non-sample aligned data. We see that most of our models, including the pre-model, perform better than conventional metrics on non-sample aligned audio as we have in Boku and F15Net. We, look, we also see that PESC and VSQL have better 2AFC accuracy on F15Net and simulated datasets, but have lower MOS scores, suggesting that these methods preserve ordering but not scale. We also observe that the free model has higher 2AFC accuracy, but slightly lower MOS scores, suggesting that it learns perceptual ordering but not scale. Interestingly, the same model performs better than Scratch on the above two datasets, suggesting that training on classification tasks may actually produce features that correlate better with ordering. However, tuning on perceptual data can be considered as some sort of calibration on the scale information. We also observed that PESC and VSQL perform better on VOCO and F15Net than the task of bandwidth expansion, indicating that they are less correlated to human perception when measuring subtle differences, as we saw in our hearing example. And finally, we see that all spectrogram difference-based models like VGish, OpenL3, and MSE perform poorly with MOS. This is partly because phase change can destabilize the amplitude causing random variations. We have seen that our metric can evaluate the results of your algorithm, but can we actually use it as an optimization criteria for training? So to emphasize the differentiability aspect of a loss function, here we show its utility in speech enhancement. We take existing enhancement models like the deep features denoising architecture as is, but change their loss function to our metric. This small modification results in significant improvement in sound quality. Let's actually listen to a few audio examples. So let's first play the noisy clip first. But it might have done. Let's now listen to uh, the original deep features noise model. But it might have done. And finally, let's listen to our approach. But it might have done. So we see that uh, the deep features model has a small artifact in the beginning, which is actually captured better by our model. So we see that our model tends to be better than the baselines. Apart from this, we also did uh, a few baseline studies. Uh, consisting of uh, pairwise comparison tests between ours versus the baseline models. So for simplicity, we show only two of the best performing baselines here. Uh, the results are divided into various groups based on the input noise levels from yellow, low noise to blue, high noise. A higher bar means that our method was compared more favorably than the baselines. We see that our method performs better than our baselines across all four groups, but works especially well for high SNR cases as shown in yellow, where the degradation is from the background is less noticeable. These results highlight the usefulness of using our perceptual loss for this task. So going back to our example earlier, we see that all our metrics are now able to correlate with human judgment, which is great. And in summary, we designed a differentiable perceptual metric that can be used to be optimized across deep learning tasks. And we show one such application of speech enhancement. This metric is based on a framework that relies on estimating the JND of a listener. Our metric correlates well with human judgment for samples that are near to JND but is not robust for larger order perturbations. Our metric is as simple as importing it in Python and using it as a loss function in deep learning. The dataset code and resulting metric, as well as all listening test examples, are all available from our 
project page whose link is given below. For more information, please refer to our paper. Thank you for your attention.